Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over palatial marine depositional environments. So before I get into this, if you haven't seen the part one to this glacial depositional environments video, you should see the part one over glacial terrestrial systems and deposition first, because that's where I go over what a glacier is, how a glacier is formed, how it moves, how it picks up and transports and deposits material, and all of the basics about glaciers. So if you're interested in learning about that before we jump right into deposition and processes of glacial marine systems, you should watch that first. And if you've already watched that great welcome back and let's jump right in first we'll go over glacial lacustrine deposition and processes and then we'll go over glacial marine but before i jump right into this let me just mention that you might be confused because you think of glaciers as a terrestrial thing because glaciers are on land however in geology we want to focus on things that we can reconstruct from the past using the rock record and when glaciers deposit things they may do this in a way that is directly on land by creating landforms or other processes that we talked about in the last video and this is great but another way that glaciers cause distinct characteristics in the rock record that we can go and interpret later on is by glacial marine and lacustrine processes and this is where glacial sediment will melt out of a glacier and become preserved in a depositional basin and this makes up the bulk of preserved glacial sediment in our rock record Record because in these types of systems, in depositional basins, you'll get the best preservation potential in the sediment because you can build up a lot of sediment and it can be in a calm environment and not eroded because it's on land and it won't be messed up or eroded away or anything uh, as easily as the landforms that we mentioned in the last video. So this is why glacial, lacustrine, and marine processes are super important and why it's even a thing. So getting started in this glacial lacustrine slide here, we have glacial lakes, first of all, are created by meltwater from a glacier, either from erosion by the glacier or isostatic depression caused by large quantities of meltwater from glaciers. And examples of these glacial lakes include the Great Lakes and ancient examples include Lake Agassiz, which was located in Canada and a little bit into the northern U.S. And these lakes can be associated with glacial sediment in a couple different ways. So if we look at the figure to the right here we have two different types of glacial lacustrine depositional systems. First we have ice contact and second we have non-ice contact. In the ice contact we see there's direct contact between the glacial ice and the water of the lake and this causes the meltwater from the glacier and the sediment that was interglacially held to directly deposit into the lacustrine system either from Calvin glaciers which drop drop stones which we'll talk about in a second or uh, rain out diamond which we'll also talk about in a second but but these depositional processes occur directly as opposed to the indirect depositional processes that occur in non-ice contact glaciers such as in figure B. We have melt streams where you have braided fluvial systems bringing the glacial meltwater and sediment to the lacustrine system rather than the glacial ice depositing it directly. And in this type of system shown in figure B, the non-ice contact system, we typically will see the production of barbs. Barbs are annually produced couplets of coarse and then fine grain sediment that switch off between the two. This is because coarse grain, sand, silts, gravel, all these things that take more melting, more well water, more inflow, will deposit in the summer and springtime. And then the finer mud suspended sediment that's just settling down to the floor of the basin will deposit in the winter. And these layers of coarse and then fine and then coarse and then fine showing different seasonal variation will preserve and then be called varves. And in figure A, this ice contact scenario, similar barbs may be preserved, but more often what you'll have are things like drop stones and rain out diamond. Basically what happens is that coarse grain debris from icebergs, which calve off the glacier, will accumulate on the basin floor with the settling suspended clay particles, and this will cause a poorly sorted rain out diamond deposit. And rain out diamond, because of this, will characteristically have a fine grain matrix with scattered clasts, and these clasts are called drop stones. Drop stones are one of the key ways you can tell whether you're looking at an ice contact glacial lacustrine or glacial marine depositional environment, because iceberg transport is one of the only processes that can actually produce drop stones. And because of this, I put a drop stone in the title slide, if you remember. And that picture is a beautiful example of the really fine layer 
layers and then the big random drop stone in the middle. So a couple other ways to distinguish rainout diamond from other facies include drop stones, which have no preferential orientation and the whole deposit will be structureless or massive and poorly sorted. And these glacial environments can be distinguished from glacial terrestrial environments by their blanket-like geometry, fossil content, and the presence of really distinct scour marks left by grounding icebergs. And I'll show you a picture later of one of these crazy iceberg scour marks. They're super distinctive of this kind of environment. So to show you some real life examples now of glacial lacustrine deposits, we have in figure A, a non-ice contact deposit of thinly laminated silt and clay barbs, where we can see the dark muddy layers of the winter deposition. And then we have the lighter, a little bit coarser grained and thicker bedded deposits of the summer and spring sediment. And this has been interpreted to have been a distal part of the lake basin. And one way you can actually tell that it is a distal part of the lake basin rather than near the slope or edge of the lake is because the coarser grained laminae and the muddy thinner and finer grained laminae are not that different in thickness. And what you'll have more often when you are closer to that slope in the lake is you'll have a bigger difference in the thickness of the coarser grained laminae than the finer grained laminae. Because in the summer, when you have all those inflow events, they only travel so far into the lake basin. And so when you're close to the edge, you're going to get thicker deposits right there where it's all depositing. And then as it goes further into the lake basin, only the finer stuff will be further out into the distal part of that lake basin. And so you'll see this more uniformed var deposit in these parts of the basin. So then down in figure C, we can see that the ice contact deposit shown here has much less structures. So we can already check off the box of structureless. It also seems pretty random because it has this random splotch of clustered ice rafted debris in the area pointed out by the black arrow and scattered clasts all around in its fine grain matrix. And these clasts or drop stones are very characteristic of that ice contact type of glacial lacustrine environment. And now I promised that I'd show you a scour caused by an iceberg. And this is what we can see in this picture to the right. We have a cross-sectional view through an iceberg scour shown here. And this is in a glacial lacustrine diamond, which was then infilled by deltaic sand. To give you some scale, this scour mark here is actually four meters deep. So now getting into glacial marine deposition, we kind of already hit the main different types of glacial marine deposition in the glacial lacustrine part, because basically you can have ice contact or what's called ice proximal and then ice distal environments. So we'll talk about ice proximal first and then ice distal, but it's kind of the similar distinction as ice contact and non-ice contact in glacial lacustrine systems. So you already have that background there. So in glacial marine depositional environments, we have a little bit of a confusing concept to go over. Basically, climate and proximity to ice margin will dictate amount of meltwater that will reach the marine environment and actually deposit sediment into that basin. However, you might expect areas with more glaciers and ice sheets and just really full of ice will have a lot of glacial marine deposits, but that's not the case. What you'll find is that colder, drier climates like Antarctica, which has tons of ice, will actually not cause a lot of glacial marine deposition. And this is because it's so cold and dry that there's not a lot of melting going on. However, in temperate glacial environments like Alaska, you have tons and tons of meltwater that reaches the basin and deposits glacial sediment. And so the more temperate and the more drastic the change from season to season in terms of melting and freezing, the more deposition you're going to get when you do have the melting occur. And I talked about the importance of meltwater in the last video, and here I'm restating that. Meltwater is important. You can't just have ice. It has to be not just cold and dry, but also melting to actually do anything geologically that will be preserved. So in terms of ice proximal bases, we're going to talk a little bit about these eight different types of ice proximal glacial marine deposits shown in this figure. Number one at the bottom of the page, we have glaciotectonized sediments or bedrock. We talked about glaciotectonism in a previous video, so if you want to learn more about that, you can look there. But basically, the ice that is retreating, causing the formation of the lake or feeding more meltwater to the lake, has once been over this sediment shown in the little circle that says one, and that caused a glaciotectonism of that sediment 
sediment and now is what characterizes that sediment because that glaciotectonism in that sediment is going to be preserved and we can go interpret it later. And then you have two, which is deformation till. We talked about three different types of till in the last video. We had meltout till, lodgement till, and deformation till. If you want to understand how these three types of till get produced and posited by glaciers, you can watch that video. But basically deformation till is when you have glaciers that are flowing over unconsolidated sediment and deforming it. Then we have three in this figure shown on the bottom right, which is in this green area, which is stratified diamond deposited by slumping of till and other debris. And then we have four, which is shown on the floor of the basin, and it is mud with ice rafted debris, just like we talked about for the glacial lacustrine systems. There's icebergs that transport sediment by rafting and then drop it out. And this is called ice rafted debris or rain out debris or diamond, whatever you want to call it, but it comes from the icebergs and it scatters within a fine muddy matrix. And then you have five, which is shown in the orange here on the lower right side of the figure. And it is channeled gravel and sand of a submarine fan. And this is an older previous submarine fan deposit, not a current one. Whereas we can see a current submarine fan forming in the middle of this figure due to the glacial meltwater. And this brings us to number six, which is slumps and sediment gravity flow bases. And then we have seven, which is shown under the iceberg here. We have iceberg scour marks and plumes of suspended sediment around these icebergs that is melting out of the icebergs as well as being disturbed at the bottom of the basin and suspended up into the water column because of the disturbance by the glacier. And then you have number eight, which is this push ridge or marinal bank shown in the front of the glacier. And is basically where the glacier will push when it wants to advance and then leave behind this kind of marinal bank when it retreats. So here we have this wonderful image with a typical continental margin showing the principal glacial marine environments and representative vertical profiles or strat columns through the sediment accumulating in these environments. And these glacial marine deposits dominate the record of pre-Pleistocene glaciations in Earth history because the terrestrial record is easily eroded. This is something I already mentioned, but is an important concept to remember. Remember how young the Pleistocene is. If you're not familiar with the geologic time scale, you can watch my geologic time scale and relative dating episode. But basically, the Pleistocene was like yesterday in geologic time. And so anything pre-Pleistocene is pretty much going to be preserved only if it's glacial marine. The glacial terrestrial record gets eroded so easily. So anyway, in this figure, we can see that we have this one shown here and then this strap column here. What we can see in this inner shelf strap column is glaciotectonized shelf sediments where the glacier was actually on the sediment, deforming it and tectonizing it. And then we have till deposited directly from the glacier. And I talk about till deposition in the glacial terrestrial video. And then we have ice contact subaqueous outwash. So outwash from that glacier, which is in contact with the water. And then we have iceberg scours and mud infill. So these scour marks shown near the number one in this figure will show up in the rock record because they get scoured in the pre-existing sediment and then are infilled by mud. And then we have some regular marine shelf environment sediments once again. Then moving to the mid shelf for number two, similarly, we have a lot of till deposited and glaciotectonized sediment again, and then ice contact fan facies. So this is where you might get some submarine fan deposition this far out into the basin. And if you want to understand more about fan deposition and stratigraphy, you can watch the submarine fan environment video. But basically, this is just similar to the inner shelf strap column. And then we have a number three showing a little bit of different strap column, basically a lot of till and then getting into rain out diamond. This is where we'll have some icebergs start to rain out their sediment and we'll get some randomized pebbles and clasts of drop stones in our fine muddy matrix. You'll also get some iceberg scours and bioturbation and you'll continue to get some turbidites or these are some submarine fan depositional facies as we go out into the marine basin. Four, we have the slope environment. This slope environment will be dominated by a lot of slumpy sediment. So these squiggly lines represent slumped sediment. This is because it's on the slope. You'll get a lot of gravity causing slumps and slide scars and contourite drift and debris flow deposits. And we can see a lot of that in this strap column. And then we have number five, where we actually have this submarine fan shown in the figure in the modern sediment here in this basin. Down the slope, we get this huge submarine fan. And we have a lot of turbidites because of that. And we have graded sands, which are also really characteristic of proximal submarine fan depositional lobes. And then we have massive graded gravels 
cells because we have this urn channeling through this really coarse grain melt out sediment from the glacier that is all being put into this submarine fan at the bottom of the slope. These submarine fan deposits often cause graded bedding and so this coarse grained graded bedding finding upward sequence is pretty characteristic of the submarine channel and depositional lobes. And then you have the distal submarine fan part in number six and this is going to be dominated by a little bit finer grained sediment but still braided sands and a lot of turbidite type sequences and then finally pelagic mud in the most distal part of that fan. So anyway in this slide basically what you can take away from it is that in these last two strata columns you get a lot less direct glacial impact and so you don't have that clear mindset that this basin has to be ice proximal whereas in the strat columns of the environments closer to that glacier you get a lot more of that direct glacial impact from the till from the rain out diamond from the iceberg scours all of that is really distinct and definitive evidence for the glacial proximal environment so to wrap up on ice proximal glacial marine deposition we have to talk a little bit about high sea level and the differences in sea level causing differences in deposition in these types of basins basically in times of high sea level you'll have low energy mud deposition dominating and so in this figure in the middle on the top what we can see is that this is representative of this a shown here so interglacial high stand and then we'll talk about what we have when we're at b so an intermediate change between high and low sea level and then we'll have c or low sea level and what happens during those times so for b we have shown here in this top figure this sea level changing period where you'll have icebergs released from the floating glacial ice and then you'll have coarse grained rain out diamond deposits and at times of a low sea level in figure c at the bottom we have typically ice advancing across the shelf eroding and abrading previously deposited sediment to create this marine boulder pavement of till deposits and we could see that in this figure on the previous slide with this boulder pavement here in the outer shelf that will be at times of low sea level and then also at times of low sea level moving basinward from the ice margin you'll have carbonate production occur in the absence of meltwater sediment supply during colder conditions and this is because of calmer conditions in the water and so the carbonate can actually not only be produced but also accumulate so now moving on to ice distal glacial marine deposition what we have here in this picture is a google earth image of an example of where you have an ice distal environment what we have here is this huge braided river system that is full of these glaciers meltwater all of the glaciers you see on that continent there have meltwater that are feeding to this river and sending all of their meltwater and sediment down into this marine basin but in a, in a way that is more distal and kind of indirect rather than the direct deposition that we saw with the ice proximal processes so here are some pictures of the glacial continental slope facies of the Yakutaga formation I think I'm saying that right exposed in the coastal mountain ranges in the Gulf of Alaska which is a great place to find glacial marine deposition <laughs> and what we have in these deposits in for example figure a we have a large contorted rafts of sandstone turbidites within a diamictite facies and slumping of continental slope deposits and so we can see that they're slumping and there's sandstone turbidites but in contrast to C there aren't any really ice proximal indicators like drop stones or anything so C would be probably ice proximal because it's got a random drop stone indicative of an iceberg and that's indicative of ice proximal environment rather than distal deposition so unfortunately we aren't going to focus too much on ice distal deposition because there's not that much difference between ice distal deposition in a marine basin than there is with deltaic deposits submarine fan deposits estuarine deposits tidal depositional environments anything else we've talked about along the shoreline is going to be similar to these distal type of environments because you'll have a fluvial system moving the outwash from the glaciers into the basin and that fluvial system pretty much reworks everything so it's way easier to recognize ice proximal glacial marine deposition than ice distal ice distal what you're going to have to look for is type of sediment shape structure of the class angularity all those things but again fluvial systems can rework a lot of things and therefore something angular or smooth that may have been indicative of a glacial transport may be eroded by fluvial systems and therefore just not preserved the 
way the ice left it. So moving right along to glaciation periods in the geologic record, these are ice ages. There hasn't been just one, there's been a lot. And so we're gonna go over some of these past glaciation periods. Basically, major multi-million year long glaciation periods are called glacio epochs. And these epochs are what we're gonna focus on for our major glaciation periods in the rest of this video. Basically, like we've already talked about, the bulk of glacial sediment is delivered to marine environments by meltwater or by ice sheets bulldozing sediment across continental shelves. And this is why pre-Pleistocene glacial records are overwhelmingly preserved in marine rocks rather than terrestrial settings. There have been six major glacial epochs in pre-Pleistocene Earth history, so the last ice age that you guys probably are, are most familiar with is not pre-Pleistocene. It happened in the Pleistocene, so we are not talking about this right now. We're talking about the six previous glacial epochs. So in this figure, we can see these circled areas, and this is basically a timeline. It's a little hard to read, so I'm going to walk through it. Basically, what we have is the beginning in the left and the end, not the end, hopefully, but the, where we're at now in time on the right. So basically, if we look down here in this lower red outlined area, they indicate here how to read this timeline. Basically, you have these periodic diamonds showing up on this timeline, and these diamonds are showing tectonics. So growth of tectonics is the upside of the diamond, and then going down is the rift of tectonics. So growth is like growing a supercontinent, continents going together, converging, and then the rifting is coming apart, diverging. And so you have a breaking up of supercontinents or just continents in general. And so when continents are growing, you sometimes have ice cover formed during collisional phases and active margins of continents. And then as the continents break up, you also sometimes get ice cover formed during the rifting processes. So in the case of the Archean Glacio Epoch, you have ice cover form during the rifting processes, the breaking up of the continents. And then you have the second major glacial epoch in the Paleoproterozoic, the early Proterozoic eon. And this is about 2.3-ish billion years ago. And this is also occurring in the rifting process of continents as continents rift apart. Then you have a huge non-glacial interval between 2.2-ish billion years ago to less than 1 billion years ago. And after that huge non-glacial glacial interval, you get the third major glacial epoch, which was in the Neoproterozoic, the late Proterozoic eon. It's a long eon, and it also occurred during rifting. And then you have a little bit of a change. You get some glaciation in this fourth glacial epoch in the growth period of continents. And this is the Saharan glacial epoch. And then you have the Gondwanan glacial epoch. And this is nearing the end of the Paleozoic. And this is in the period where continents begin to rift again. And then you have the sixth major glacial epoch before the Pleistocene, which was in the Cenozoic. And it's this little, little dot right here. And it isn't really associated with any major growth or breaking up of continents. But basically, the timing of the major glacial epoch shown in this timeline indicate a major correlation between these glaciation events and supercontinent growth and rifting. And I have no idea why. <laughs> but that's maybe for a different video. I don't know. Um, but basically, it's just an interesting correlation I thought I'd point out in this figure. So lastly, we'll talk a little bit about Snowball Earth and whether it was actually Snowball Earth or not. You may have heard of Snowball Earth before or maybe not, but basically it's a time in Earth history during the Neoproterozoic around 750 to 600 million years ago, which was also the Neoproterozoic glacial epoch we mentioned on the timeline in the previous slide. And this event is called Snowball Earth because it's the most extensive glaciation period in Earth's history where we actually find evidence for glaciers having been covering continents that would have been near the equator at the time, meaning that if they're at the equator, they're everywhere. And so that means that Earth was entirely covered in ice, which is insane to think about, but that's why it's called Snowball Earth. And some scientists have argued for one or more Snowball Earth events during the Neoproterozoic, in which all hydrologic and biological activity ceased for periods of up to 10 million years at a time, which is insane because you would think that biological activity would need 
to continue in order for life to continue. It's pretty unlikely that it all went extinct and then started back up again 10 million years later by re-evolving completely. And so what makes more sense is actually our more recent interpretations of the glacial deposits during this time. So basically many deposits that were previously thought to be glacial tillites are now thought to be recognized as sediment gravity flow deposits within rift basins, indicating a functional hydrologic system at the time. Also, new tectonic data indicates the waxing and waning of ice cover as tectonic processes created repositories for glacial marine facies to deposit in rift basins offshore. And this highlights the importance of understanding how to recognize and interpret ancient glacial deposits in the rock record, because this can either determine whether all of hydrologic and biological activity ceased or whether it was just that glaciation was at a maximum, but there was still an underlying functioning hydrologic system driving biologic activity. But basically, it's super important. And a more likely scenario now for snowball earth is actually just regional scale glaciations tied to the progressive breakup of Rodinia, which was a supercontinent back then that was breaking up during this time. And like we said, there's correlations between supercontinent breakup and ice ages. Because of this new and improved interpretation of this snowball earth event or multiple snowball earth events, basically we now call it slush ball earth events instead. <laughs> and so I know that's a little weird and you know, we just have to be correct. We can't say snowball earth if it wasn't a snowball earth, it was a slush ball earth. And that brings me back to the point I want to end on for this whole Galatia depositional environment video part one and two, the importance of meltwater. If you didn't have hydrologic systems, you wouldn't have flowing ice and you wouldn't actually have deposition and preservation of your glacial deposits. So clearly hydrologic systems and just meltwater in general and moving water is important to actually preserve these sediments. So if we had a snowball earth, you would expect nothing to be actually deposited during that time if the hydrologic system came to a halt. But it likely didn't and that is why biology could move on and we could eventually evolve. So yay for slush ball earth and not snowball earth. That is all I have for you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video and it helped you understand a little bit about glacial marine processes and deposition and why glacial marine deposition is so important in terms of glacial sediment preservation. Like I said, we have now finished all of the depot systems videos. So if you're interested in looking back at any of them, I have compiled them in order in the playlist to the bottom of the screen here. So if you want to go watch those, please feel free to click down below. And I can't wait to see you guys in our next video. So thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.